Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Bovine Intoxications Involving Forages. Our speaker is Dr. Tim Evans. Uh, he's an associate professor and head of toxicology at Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab, University of Missouri. And you can read all about that in here. What I want to tell you is about my own particular experience with Dr. Evans. I had I don't even remember what it was some years ago, and I asked my Dr. Wilt, my veterinarian, the question, and he didn't know. He said, call Dr. Evans. Well, who's Dr. Evans? And I, I didn't have a whole lot of confidence that I would get much satisfaction from talking to some academic in Columbia, but I called the number, Dr. Evans answered the phone, and, and I don't remember what I called you about or what your answer was, but what I do remember is that Dr. Evans took plenty of time to explain to me the answer, and he was very civil and very cordial about it, and I really appreciated the, the, the response that I got to that question. So he's a nice guy, and he'll take the time to answer your, your uh, I'm Dr. Almost I'm, I'm almost teary-eyed now. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Evans, if you will. You know, this has been a great a great meeting. Um, I got to tell you, Drexel, man, that guy knows a lot. That is really, that that's really good stuff. And, and again, as we've gone through some of these things in the last two years, I have learned that I wish more of our veterinary students could get agronomy lectures and get soil health lectures and get a lot more of that information and incorporate it so that we can, so we get it, so we understand that we can talk to you. Because in all honesty, most of the things that I deal with other than, you know, other than we deal with the, the, the fescue toxicosis, but as far as nitrates and cyanide and a lot of that other stuff, and a lot of toxic plants, it's just because we've trashed the soil, nothing's going to grow except some of these invasive species. That's what happens. And so I, if, from the thing I got from Drexel's lecture um, is, again, intentional randomness, but intentional randomness will maintain cycles. And cycles are regenerative and they keep things going. And I think that's, and you gotta do it strategically and intentionally. Now, I will tell you that I make a basic uh, definition that we have cattle producers and we have cattle owners. And they are not the same. It doesn't, and it's not dependent on the number of cattle that you've got, okay? But the cattle producers are the people who come to the lectures, interact with extension, interact with their veterinarians, listen, and make those kinds of decisions that are gonna work for their management system. We're not all the same. We're all in different management systems, and we gotta make the decisions that are gonna work best for what we've got and what we're trying to do. But one of the things that I've listened, and it's not, oh come on, it's not that gonna be that good a talk, but you're, you're fine, you can leave quickly there. So uh, one of the things is, is that, 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 that I think is, in really, is really important. And one of the reasons why people can do well in Missouri with, with their cattle is the grass. We can feed, they can eat grass and do well. Hay's expensive. The one thing I've learned, hay is expensive. And so if you're maintaining those cycles, maintaining that soil health, and I'd love to talk to drugs a little bit because I deal a lot with deficiencies in minerals and other things, and I'm always wondering about, you know, some of our soil, is it in certain places, particularly where soil that used to be a river or a stream or a, cre or a branch or I learned, see, branch, the joke on the branch is that somebody called me about uh, a cow that was stuck in a branch. And I was from California, the state at that time, and I was trying to figure out, well, that's going to be problematic. I don't know how I'm going to get a cow out of a branch. Okay, I figured it out. I saw it was water. I did the first and only underwater rectal palpation I have ever done on that cow. And shocking. The students did not want to follow me into the water. So there we go. So that's fine. And uh, yeah. So so I think if we're if we're looking at this, hopefully this lecture 
will be uh, very complementary, but also uh, I have a little math, but not as much as Drexel did, but hopefully we can put this together on why we're concerned about some of the things that we're doing, okay? So it's bovine intoxications involving forages. Uh, I'm Dr. Tim Evans. I'm trying out a lecture. You guys are getting your first vet school lecture today. I'm trying out a lecture. I know, some going, oh, holy crap, I'm getting out of here right now. Nope, nope, you guys are good. Uh, just to see how it's going to work, and uh, we'll see. All right. Now, what I want to tell you, because this is really, to, to explain, people want to interact and engage. They want to go ahead and learn and look. So, so what are we seeing here? What, what do we got? Lice. Yeah, I mean, the hair coat looks a little light. Lice. Yeah, I mean, we got a little, that, that cow looks terrible. Okay, let's just, just, let's just be honest. I mean, I go, whew, something's wrong. Okay, not in great body condition, just to let you know. Fighting words in Missouri, if you go up to somebody and you say, well, those cows are thin, you're probably going to be chased off the property with someone shaking a firearm at you. I'm just telling you. And then what the guy's going to do is the next day he's going to give them a ton of, gr of ground corn and then he's going to kill them all, okay, because they're going to get grain overload. So there you go. That's just my life. My life is things die. So we got, and we got cows. Okay, these cows don't look so good in, the, in their in their coat. We got this one cow that's standing water. Now, in California, this state, what's left of it, that where you can actually have livestock? Okay, cows are terrestrial mammals. Okay, they they live on the ground. Okay, when I came to Missouri, the first thing I noticed was, oh my gosh, they're either amphibious or they're aquatic. I mean, it's like, this is something, something is wrong. I mean, I just said, what is happening here? So it got pretty quick, it got pretty quick to the idea that, and I had people who would tell me that when they were growing up in Missouri, no grass would be growing. I mean, they're just, you didn't find some places you just didn't have a lot of grass. And then this guy in Kentucky, went ahead and uh, Professor Fergus in about 1931 went ahead and found this grass that would grow everywhere okay and so fescue's gone ahead and uh, so it was fescue and we now know there's Kentucky 30, 31 tall fescue which has an endophyte which all that means is you got a fungus growing inside of it okay now I have had people who have told me that they could look at grass and tell whether it had endophyte in it or not, okay? That is complete nonsense. Oh, thank God I just saw the young kids and I didn't use the word I was thinking. So that is, whoa, whoo, that was a close one. Anyway, so that is nonsense, okay? That's nonsense. So if it's inside the plant, you can't see it, okay? Yeah, but most of... The end, most of the, the tall fescue in this state is end of fescue, okay? Now, my opinion of fescue uh, as a forage is, I think for the most part it's a manageable crop, okay? I mean, I think it can, we can manage our way with stockpiling, with looking at other different types of grasses, with uh, pasture rotation. There's a lot of things we can do to manage the situation. Now, John, would you agree with me or am I? Okay. I, I mean, I got to be honest. I mean, I love Missouri and I love the fact that we have cattle in Missouri. And if I, I got some colleagues that say, why well, I fest you? That's the end of everything. I don't think that's a really good thing to talk about since that's all we got. That's what we're grazing. grazing. That's what we're going to have. That's not a really very productive thing to say. And if the state veterinarian, Dr. Struber, heard me say that, it could be ugly. So, so the fact is, is that we can, our cattle, Missouri cattle, can, can be great. But we just got to be smart. And the smart part is being cattle producers. You all being here today, 
are cattle producers, okay? You might, I only have one cow. Yes, but you're still a cattle producer, and you're going to produce that one cow. The problem I run into with all, are you leaving? Don't leave. Don't leave. Okay, that's okay. All right, that's fine. It's your loss. Not maybe mine. Anyway, so the bottom line is, is that cattle owners, basically it's, they've been successful enough with not really doing anything. They don't have to do anything. The cows are going to, beef cows are going to do what they need to do. And, and honestly, beef cows are basically God's version of an all-terrain vehicle, okay? I mean, the things that a beef cow can put up with, you can have a calf hanging out the back of it for about 12 hours and still have a live calf, okay? It can go ahead, it can not have water, not have food, it's great. If a beef cow went up to a dairy cow and just told the dairy cow just a little bit of the things it was going through that day, that dairy cow's gonna twist something, okay? It's gonna displace an apple mesa, it's gonna do whatever, and if it did it to a horse, Oh my gosh, it's got a colic infounder, the only two diseases in horses, so there we go. So, you know, beef cattle can do a lot of things, and so you can get this false sense of security that you don't need to do anything. But the fact of the matter is, you have to manage them. I remember, I remember when I was, uh, when I was, when I was growing up and, and do, being an animal science major and all that stuff, but people would make you believe that because the animal had a rumen, you could feed it anything, and it would turn it into meat. I mean, it's like, go ahead, put coal in there, and it will shoot out a diamond. Okay, it's not going to shoot out a diamond, okay? It's not going to happen. But you gotta, you got to feed them, and you got to know what they're getting, okay? So, the other thing that's really important to know is that in the evolving picture of what's going on with 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 cattle and forages and different parts of the country. There's a, a new theory going out there, or at least a new awareness, this idea of the microbiome. <coughs> all that means, because people want to use big words and confuse you, all it means is what is the population of microorganisms that are in that rumen, essentially, in other parts of the animal. And I believe that the microbiome in cattle in Utah, Wyoming, Montana, um, in Missouri, New Mexico, it's not the same. Those animals have developed a different way to use different forages. And one of the things that's really critical when we talk about fescue is that cattle that have been adapted to fescue, cattle that have been raised in Missouri or in areas where we got fescue, we can manage that. You take a naive cow, you go ahead and say, well, I'm going to get something from South Dakota, bring it down here, and it will eventually adapt if it lives, okay? It's just really tough on them. So I think there's a big difference, and as you look through the literature, it really makes a difference of, of whether the animals they're talking about being exposed to uh, the, the, the fescue and the compounds in it makes a big difference if the animals are naive or if the animals are adapted. And most of the cattle in our state, they're going to be adapted. The sheep in our state, they're going to be adapted. And so I, I have some issues with some of this data that comes out using unadapted animals to, 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 to paint the picture bleaker that because just to let you know, I, I don't think we're going to get rid of fescue. I, I, I don't think so. And uh, I mean, I think the the friendly fescue and all that. Well, that's fine, but you got to be able to do that when you can afford to do it. And if you can't afford to do it, it it's going to be tough. So there we go. All right. What problems do you see here? Okay. What do we see? Does this look good? So anyone think this looks good? <laughs> Excellent, you got the point. You don't have to come up with the math, you don't have to figure anything. That's bad. I learned that a very long time ago. That's bad. So that's good. So you guys are good, all right? You know, that's bad. And horses, that's, it's a much different thing to manage fescue toxicosis with horses because it doesn't take very much to make everything go wrong, okay? And so, 
horses, like you guys, you see cattle. Well, you guys saw a calf coming out like that. Well, that's a cow having a baby, okay? That doesn't happen in horses very often, okay? Cattle, you get big bull, little heifer, and you can get dystocias, and that's fine. That's a difficult bird. That's a fancy word that makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about. Horses, that doesn't happen very often. That doesn't happen. That's a wreck, okay? And I, I lived in California for a number of years, was a re resident veterinarian on, on some rich people's brood bear farms, and I could count on one hand in the 10 years out of the 1,000 foals I, I was involved in, the number that had a difficult birth. Not in the state of Missouri because of the, because of the fescue. And so it doesn't take very much to cause a problem in a, in a, in a late gestational manner. So it's the horses are not the same as cattle when you're grazing them on fescue pastures and things like that. The last, definitely the last 30 to 60 days of, of a horse's pregnancy, it shouldn't be anywhere near a uh, fescue. I mean, it should be somewhere else. All right, now, here's my lecture. We're going to talk about fescue toxicosis. Okay, there we go. And, all right, here we go. Now, I want to let you know that the little guy in the cape, this is going to scare you all, but I have a superhero alter ego, the antidote. And that's actually a cartoon of the antidote, okay? And one of these days, the kids that are in here, you're going to walk, look on TV, that guy's going to be there. And I'm going to be retired, and you're going to say, I knew him when he was smart. And so we, there we go. But anyway, so what we have is we have fescue. Now, this is called the fescue belt. The fescue belt, okay? We're barely in the corn belt, but we're definitely in the fescue belt. And again, uh, this is where areas where fescue is particularly well adapted to growing, okay? And so certainly Missouri is one of the one of the main ones. And if you were to, and again the other thing is, is that the grass needs the grass has a has a relationship, a symbiotic relationship, um, whereby the plant benefits the fungus and the fungus benefits the plant, okay? So a symbiotic relationship is ideally like when you're married, okay? You're both supposed to be benefiting one another. A parasitic relationship is a relationship you have with your children, okay? They're basically taking everything and you're not getting anything back. See, you you great, you identify, you got it. I got a 30-year-old and a 30, almost 30-year-old. It's moved out of my basement now. This is good. This is good. And then I got a uh, almost 33-year-old, and and, uh, and that's great. But you can see we're Kentucky 31 minus, uh, not doing so hot. Kentucky 31 plus, doing well. Okay. Is the minus like the, the end of I three? Is that what they've got? Yeah. That well, when I say an E minus, I'm meaning something that doesn't have the endophyte in it. The friendly endophyte would be a friendly endophyte plus, but. You can take fescue seed, and if you store it long enough, it will not have the endophyte. It eventually dies, okay? But the problem is the grass doesn't grow. Yeah, it just doesn't grow as well. And so, so the problem is we deal with the, the E+, plus because it provides some benefits to the plant, if that makes sense. Are we good? All right. Are you good, too? No, MFA, I'm just trying to help yeah, yeah. MFI. M MFI, that's a whole different thing. So it's a novel MFI. Ah, there you go. So let's let's talk about first we got we got fescue and it doesn't have an endify. Okay? Doesn't have an endify. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I don't have any help. I don't know what to do. I'm gonna die. Okay? If you have the endify and it's the the you have, let's say it's the toxic endify. It's helping the plant, but it's also producing compounds that adversely affect animals, okay? Now, somebody got really smart, got really smart, and they said, okay, there are, th there are compounds that this endophyte produces which are beneficial to the plant. So we can miss, you know, we can keep those. There's some bad genes, let's get rid of those. 
And that's where the novel end of fight, friendly end of fight, that's where that comes. Does that make sense? Okay. Drexel, I said a really a lot of nice things about you when you were not here. Yeah, so I'm we're golden. Okay. Yeah. Golden. You're you're a smart dude. That's all I can say. So I've got all these names up here, but what I really want to show you is that there's a reason why there's a benefit that the plant gets from the end of it. Makes it more, I mean, one thing you could say about, one thing you could say about Missouri, um, you don't come here for the weather, okay? Let's just be honest. You can have a flood day, a drought day, a snow day, or tornado day, all in the same day, okay? The kids don't know why they're not going to school. Hey, we, you're not going to school today. They don't know why it is. I mean, it could be five or six different things, but that's okay. And when grass doesn't really like that, okay, it doesn't really like having, having to change all the time. So the uh, endophyte, in the simplest way, produces some chemicals which helps the grass to adapt to the things that happen. Drexel, am I doing okay there? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, because I'm like, I'm like grasshopper to your, to your master. So there we go. All right, that, that's a scary thought. And that means that anyone that understood that reference is talking about kung fu. So if you don't know that, that I'm sorry. You're, you're, you are blessed with youth, but not with knowledge. So there we go. So then you've got these compounds, ergot alkaloids. Let's just say there's a whole bunch of these compounds, ergot alkaloids. The big one that we see in in endophyte effective toll fescue was ergovalin, okay? Ergovalin. So it's an ergopeptin alkaloid, great. Okay? In cattle, susceptible species, cattle, we get dry gangrene fescue foot when it's cold, and when it's hot, we have come up with the very, the ingenious name of summer slump, okay? Summer slump. And I have students ask me, well, when does summer slump happen, Dr. Evans? Oh, it happens in the winter. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. I'm sorry those didn't get that, but that's okay. So, when it's cold, so in cattle, because the effects are associated with blood vessels constricting, it is very weather dependent. And Missouri can have very cold winters. I don't want to tell Missouri that right now because it's been nice today. And it can have really miserable summers. And that's when we're going to see the worst effects. There are people who will tell you, well, I don't, you know, I don't think you know, fescue's that big a deal. I mean, I can feed it and nothing happens. Well, if you're dealing with really nice weather, it may not. Now, in horses, okay, horses, uh, it causes major problems during uh, late gestation, late pregnancy, no milk. As I like to tell our students, agalactia, 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 agalactia. And they say, Dr. Evans, uh, uh, is, is A. galacti important? I don't usually say things four or five times unless it's important. So yeah, that's the main thing and other things can occur from there. Okay, so what happens, what happens in cattle is you get these ergot alkaloids and they make those blood vessels constrict, you get vascular compromise and you get the fancy word ischemia. Ischemia, all that means is you're not getting blood flow, okay? Well, let's just let you guys know, hey, somebody comes up to me and says, hey, you're not looking very bright today. I think you've got some ischemia. You better sock them, okay? I'm just telling you, they just insulted you. By the way, I can, I can say that here. Drexel got away with saying beating several times. In, in Columbia, I cannot beat anything, okay? If I talk about beating somebody, I will get, I can guarantee you, because I've done it, I will get an email that says, hey, child abuse isn't funny, Dr. Evans. You shouldn't be teaching anymore. Just, so I can't say the beating thing. It's okay. it's okay. I'm just letting you know. You can't do that in Columbia. I can't say beating. All right. So ischemia, no blood supply. No blood supply. So what that means is in the when it's cold, you're going to get dry gangrene. And when it is hot, you're going to get summer slump. All right, so here we go. Cold fescue foot oftentimes happens to be the left hind. Uh, how do you know it's fescue foot? There's a little sign on it. Fescue foot. Okay, and that's how I diagnose most diseases. I look for the label. And then summer slump, 
Okay, we got cattle out there. They, they're, they're of those uh, uh, aquatic organisms. Uh, and if they go on land, they're amphibious. And then when we talk about abdominal fat necrosis, usually uh, that's with chronic, chronic, chronic exposure. And I mean, it's just this fat is surrounding the kidney. That's not really good for health. You don't want your kidneys to look like that, okay? <laughs> for some reason, I don't know why, but the fescue, if you're ever in a fescue trivia question, uh, you know, you're, we're doing fescue trivia today, and someone says, uh, the, the left foot of the, of the cow during cold weather in Missouri, you buzz, what is the left hind foot? And you will get $5,000 in a car. There you go. I'm there for you guys. I'm there for you guys. All right. So, all right. Now, in horses, it, it, basically, same thing. You don't get any uh, pro prolactin, and you can, don't get any milk. And then everything else goes to heck in a handbasket. Okay? Bad. This is all bad. There you go. All right. Now, there is fescue. There is, there is um, uh, E plus fescue. And it's an endophyte. You can't see it. But there is a cousin. There's a cousin called ergot. And it replaces the seed head. And it looks like, there's small children here, but it looks like rat or mouse poop. Okay? I mean, not that I'm an expert on mouse or rat poop, but that's what I imagine it to look like. Okay, those are, well that looks like something else, but anyway, but <laughs> anyway, so we see this. Now, even E plus fescue can get infected with ergot, and that's, a, and that's a lot. And ergot produces similar compounds. You can get the same disease, but there's so much more in the way of the ergot alkaloids compared to what you see in the fescue that you can see in much worse condition. Does that make sense? Okay. Guys in the middle, did you get that? Are we good? All right, we're good. All right, that's fine. Young man in the very back, are you good? All right, good. He didn't nod his head, but I think he's okay. All right. So, there's lots of differentials, okay? What do we do about it? Well, basically, to we, the way I like to teach it is, to diagnosis, we look for evidence of exposure to the toxicant. That's EAT. Okay. Evidence of exposure to the toxicant. Identify E plus tall fescue. Evidence of consumption of E plus uh, tall fescue. We can run, our lab routinely does measurements of that. And then consistent clinical and diagnostic abnormalities, which <coughs> is cicada. So we eat cicada. There we go, I have to, I have to, there we go. Got it. So, we see the problems, okay, that's clinical science, might not be consistent, all these other things, but again, in horses we're going to see agalactia, and we're going to see ergot, we'll see with the ergot alkaloids, dry gangrene, uh, well, okay, and with the fescue, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see a fescue foot in the winter, uh, dry gangrene in the, uh, excuse me, fescue foot in the winter, we're going to see summer slump in the summer, but with ergot, it has so many more of those compounds that it's not as temperature dependent and we'll see dry gangrene in the spring or summer. So how many of you seen cattle losing their switch in the summer or the spring of the summer? Generally, in my opinion, that it could be associated with some fescue, but generally if I see that, I'm going to be concerned about some type of ergot. And we generally see ergot when we get these cool, wet springs. So, you know, we go, go ahead and get these cool, wet springs, and all of a sudden you start seeing the little black bodies showing up. Has anyone seen those? Oh, I mean, for, sorry, there we go. Has anyone seen those? There you go, okay. All right. All right, so what do we do? Well, bottom line is basically we remove remove animals from the source. And so, what are we gonna do with cattle? Pasture management, key. Remove or reseed, okay? We get rid of the E plus tall fescue or we reseed it. 
Uh, it's a money, time, regrowth, roll of the cattle market in making our decisions. Did Drexel just turn to this young man? Considerable improvement. Uh, I, it is. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a compliment. You're funny. Don't worry. All right. Here's the strange man talking to me. Anyway, so, uh, endophyte free, friendly endophyte. Those are things, but it's liable to be expensive. Uh, we can ammoniate toxic fescue hay for cattle. Ammoniation, which basically uh, can go ahead and lessen uh, the, the, the toxic hay. No seed head consumption. Mow before the seed heads. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Rotate off during the summer. Grace fall regrowth, stockpile. Dilute with legumes, nitrogen application. I mean, less than 100 is still, well, that's a lot. But again, harvest pasture for hay. Make hay. If we've got, if we have, um, uh, if we make hay out of the endophyte infected tall fescue, those compounds will go down with exposure to the sunlight and heat. Okay, as it becomes hay, it decreases it. Okay? Now, the ergot bodies, those little things that look like little rat droppings hanging in the plant, guess what happens when you start shaking the hay and going ahead and putting them together? They fall out. Okay? So that can be very beneficial. This is incredible. I'm not only, I'm actually being practical. This doesn't happen very often. Yes, sir. So nitrogen application decreases the... Well, effect. if you have lots of nitrogen that you put on, it will increase the concentration of the toxic. It will increase. It will increase. Yes. It will increase. Yes. Okay, increase, sorry. It will increase because those compounds are alkaloids. They have nitrogen in the, in the chemical structure. Okay. So, Drexel, am I okay? Okay, good. That's what Drexel wants to say. Okay, so there we go. So beware that ergot bodies cannot be seen in pelletized rations. So again, when you get pelletized rations, you might not be able to see that there's contamination. If you're looking in the green, you can see it. John, do you have a question? No. Okay, because I had like brainwaves coming at me and I was kind of concerned. It wasn't you? Okay. All right, good. All right. All right. So again, animal management. Provide, provide adequate shelter shade during the winter and the summer. Guess what? If they're going to get the problem because it's really cold and they can't protect themselves, let's, let's get them where they can get, keep warm. Or if it's during the summer, let's give them some shade or give them a pond so they can become aquatic. Okay? Provide adequate water for drinking ponds for cooling off. Appropriate bedding. Please don't use ergotized straw. Okay? Not a great idea for animal comfort. Adequate nutrition, water, comfort, other supplementation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of talk out there. Graze resistant breeds and or individuals. There are ways that you can, there are tests that are out there where you can test. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Oh, man, it's very strange. Okay, good. There we go. That's fine. You can see how good I am with kids. There we go. All right. So, uh, you can have graze resistant breeds or individuals. See the genetics. People will talk about binders, enhanced spaces dilation. I don't know. I, you can't. The FDA doesn't allow you to put those labels. So, genetics. There's a, there is a genetic change in Angus-based breeds that some of these animals are going to be tolerant. So this is called the, uh, the T-SNP test. And I'm having a little problem finding an up-to-date website, but I know it's out there. But if you can identi identify animals that are more resistant to the fescue, and would it affect ergotism as well? Maybe, okay. Uh, this is the uh, Ag Botanica. Uh, if you go there and you can't find the information, um, I can go ahead and uh, you can email me at evansd at missouri.edu and I will find uh, some, I will try to find out some uh, additional information. But uh, it actually has, it's very interesting to me. All right. Next step, man, okay, we're learning a lot of things about things with ohms in them, genomics, proteomics, okay, we got metabolomics, we're looking at the fact, the microbiome, we know that when we're talking about endophyte infected tall fescue, it's just not as, in cattle, it's just not as simple 
as vasoconstriction. There's other things that it's doing, and so more research, more research is going along that, that line, okay? All right. So you don't want to be one of my students. That's when you have to memorize that for your test. So there you go. All right. Now, any questions on, on fescue? That's my fescue lesson for the day. On your fescue lesson for today, the way the weather was in Missouri, with it being real cold, a late frost, did that affect the fescue in the seed head management? Because all of the grass was stressed. Yeah. It got zapped. So here's what happens. Here's what happens in, I'm one of the few people who has memorized <laughs> the, the sexual cycle, the sexual reproductive cycle of ergot. I'm just letting you know, okay? Um, and I put that on my resume, okay? So what happens is, we go ahead, let's start with the beginning. A cool, wet spring, okay? Cool, wet spring, and we get these little, we get these little things, the little ergot bodies are in the ground, okay? They're under the dirt, and then they sprout. These little things like, like, itty bitty little mushrooms. And then those come up, and then there become these little spores that infect all the grasses and grains, in the spring, okay, and then they go ahead and they infect those seeds. Are you following me? Okay, so. It's as clear as mud. All right, let's start again. No, cool wet no, spring, I, you, Cool wet spring, the little things come up, they go into the air, and they infect the seed of the grasses, okay? All right, cool wet springs, that's what happens, and then those bodies go ahead and develop and replace the seed head. Now, part of the normal life cycle is that, and, and with all those little spores and everything, there's there's ergot sex going on, but I don't want to go into greater detail on that, okay? Just just take their word for it, okay? So then what happens is those ergot bodies, I'm almost doing a dancer, fall into the ground, go under the ground, and they overwinter in the ground. So they're not exposed to the environment until the following spring. Now, people wonder, why are we having more problem with ergot than we seem to have before? And Drexel actually hit the issue right on the head. We used to what? We used to do a lot of tilling. When we did tilling, we went ahead and we would dig up those little spores and they could not continue their life cycle. But now, with no-till, they, rem they remain in the ground and that life cycle can continue. Does that, does that make sense? I've, success I've got heads nodding. I have explained, successfully explained, ergot sex. That is so amazing. There we go. I am so, oh, how old are you? All right, we're fine. All right, there we go. So, what do we see? Those little, got the little kids left. Okay, <laughs> any potential cause for concern? Okay, here, so now we've talked about ergot and fescue. Okay, that's Ford's problem. What do we see here of any concern to anybody? Nitrates. Yeah, nitrate, because what we do, we've got cattle and we've got, we've got corn stalks. Okay, now, does it have to be a nitrate problem? Not necessarily. If they've gone ahead and there's been enough enough rain, etc., whatever, and the nitrate's gone away, that's fine. But if we've had an abnormal accumulation of nitrate and you put the cattle out there, we could potentially get problems with nitrate, uh, nitrate intoxication. Okay? So when I get a call from somebody and said, hey, we have drought stress corn, we decided to go ahead and put the cattle out on the corn stalks, and now there's a bunch of them dead. What do you think the problem is? I, well, the problem is you have some dead cows. But I think it's because it may be related to nitrate. And with nitrate, what we're going to see is the blood's going to be chocolate brown. Chocolate brown. I had one student that liked to call it doo-doo brown. I don't know why, but it's chocolate brown, okay? But that guy, it was 20 years ago, still calls me and says, hey, this is doo-doo brown. How are you? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I don't think. 
your life's been pretty tough if you think that's the best thing you've ever been called. So, so anyway, I don't think, you know, anyway, so we're going to talk about again. We've got a number of plants that can be associated uh, with nitrate accumulation. Uh, Johnson grass, certainly. Uh, pigweed, uh, uh, corn, uh, millet, okay, oats, other things. But generally, where it accumulates is generally accumulates in most cases in the stem or stalk and and generally that's where it's going to be the worst and it can move up the plant we have sometimes we have really bad years and we can have uh we can have nitrate all the way up into the tassels of corn okay same thing picture right there all right uh johnson grass certainly can have nitrates can have cyanide cyanogenic glycosides can have another thing you never need to know about okay and what's fascinating to me is that sorghum sedan looked the same way 250 years ago than it looks today, okay? That's a picture from 250 years ago, so that's okay. I, I collect pictures of toxic plants. I have a very strange life, okay? There we go, there we go. All right, pigweed certainly now, just to let you know, pigweed, it grows everywhere in the United States except the Great Lakes and the non-toxic zone in Montana. There we go. Apparently, no, no plants. No, I'm just kidding. That's a that's an error in the drawing. Okay. Okay. So, oh, there's a non-plant toxic zone. No, there isn't. Okay. But and then certainly the millet. We can see it in tall fescue. We can see it in millet. Interesting thing. I see a lot of problems in millet hay. A lot of problems in millet. I, it will it will turn out in Christmas or Christmas winter time. Someone's going ahead and they're getting toward. They're they're feeding their millet hay. And the classic is, it's when they're feeding the bottom bales of the mill of hay. Because every barn in Missouri has to have what in its roof? Holes. Holes, that's right. It's not a barn in Missouri if it doesn't have a hole in the roof. In fact, many barns in Missouri look just like Drexel's example of rain coming down. That's what it looks like. It comes to the surface, it runs through the bales, and nitrates water soluble, so it goes all the way to the bottom bales. So you go ahead, you get down to the bottom bales, and they're loaded with it, and you feed it, and they drop over dead. Okay? So it can be a, a bad thing. All right, so uh, excess of nitrate. So we have, so I am so thankful to Drexel for covering the nitrogen cycle because what we see is we get this excess of nitrate accumulated in the plants. And, and so you get that and in the animal, in the rumen, it becomes nitrite. Okay? Nitrate in the plant, nitrate in the rumen, and rumen, especially cattle. Okay, well by the way, this is a sheep doing what she seem to do best. Now I did have someone who came to me and said, hey, it's sheep, it's not sheep dying, it's bad shepherds. And I said, that's okay, that's okay, but they still die, okay? So we go, so what we have is we get plant, okay, we get plant, in the plant we get decrease in plant nitrate reductase activity. Okay, all you need to know is that enzyme is dependent on photosynthesis. So if we go ahead and have drought stress, or if we have really cloudy days, we'll get an increase in nitrate. So we increase the nitrate of the plant. In the rumen, it becomes nitrite. Nitrate crosses the rumen, okay, gets into the blood, and then nitrite plus hemoglobin, you get met hemoglobin. Yes, sir? Well, well, nitrate levels will be higher in the morning than it would be in the afternoon. You know, and, and I'm just going to answer this question the best, that seems to make some sense. However, I find it very difficult, me personally, to predict nitrate levels because there are so many factors that affect, okay? Not just, does that make sense, Drexel? It's just there's a lot of things that, stage of growth, etc. but what you're saying makes, makes sense. It's just that I have, I've quit trying to predict nitrate concentrations because they, it's, there's a lot of factors. So methemoglobinemia 
and you get chocolate brown blood. And essentially what that means, so who's had a, a high school chemistry class? Anyone have a high school? Okay, you're admitting it, that's fine. So, you probably all wondered if you took a high school, if those who did not take a high school chemistry class, your lives are better for it, okay? But if you took a high school chemistry class, you were taught that there was ferrous iron and ferric iron. And I wondered, who cares, okay? And it finally took me 45 years later to realize that the ferrous iron plus two does binds oxygen. The ferric iron plus three doesn't. So that's bad, because <laughs> you want your hemoglobin to bind oxygen. There you go. You are going to be a star at school on Monday. I'm just going to let you know. Are you ready? I'm not sure. There you go. All right. So nitrate, nitrate intoxication, met hemoglobinemia. We basically have we basically have chocolate brown blood. We get chocolate brown in the mucous membranes as well. Okay? And so, one of the things that's really important is testing. Now, we're all familiar with the extension agents have the diphenylamine, the little spot test that they can do. That detects 0.1% nitrate. Okay? That's what it detects. And so that's very sensitive, and so that's that's bad. You see the blue, okay? And or we suck, put the fluid in there, and, and and it turns blue like that. That means there's some nitrate in it, okay? And if you got nitrate, you get the nitrite, you get death, okay? Or you can just get animals that don't run want to run around. Now, before I go, let me go back. The other thing is so nitrate, so nitrate. Um, nitrate, nitrate, you get chocolate brown blood, the animals can't find oxygen, okay? Now, are there other things that can affect the animal's ability to carry oxygen? Anything that causes anemia. And what is a disease that commonly causes anemia in our cattle in this area, in Missouri, etc.? Best exactly. 10,000 points to the person who didn't say it. Anaplas. There we go. Anaplas, anaplasmosis goes ahead and it causes anemia. So guess what? If you have anaplasmosis and you have some elevated nitrate, it's going to be it's going to be worse. How many of you have ever seen an anaplas cow? A cow that's got an Okay. They are nasty. They're scary too, aren't they? You look at them and they got their eyes bulging, and they got their ears up, and they are thinking one thought, who can I kill? Right? Who can I kill? So that's, a, that's problematic. Now, we talk about how do we determine whether the plant material, if we find that there's some nitrate, we need to test it. And we need to test it quantitatively for nitrate. Okay? Nitrate. So if you're looking for nitrate, I like nitrate to be about... 2,500 parts per million. Okay, I start to get 25 to 5,000. I'm a little concerned. 5,000 5, to 10,000, more than 10,000. Danger, danger, danger. Oh, thank you. God bless you for that. That was that was amazing. I was hoping someone would get Will Robinson. Okay. All right. So that's nitrate. And so you've got to be very careful about how much you feed and how and you can dilute some of it. Um, particularly if it's 5,000, they start getting a little bit concerned about maybe getting some abortion, some premature parturition. Uh, get, getting closer to 10,000, they're going to die. Now, that's measuring night. How, how much time do I have? I'm done? Find a way to wrap it up. Okay, well, I'm almost there. That is so amazing. I'm two slides away. So, bottom line is, Bottom line is, there's another way that they measure it, which is nitrate, nitrogen. Nitrate and nitrate, nitrogen. I say that about 2,000, 2,500 parts per million nitrate is safe. That's, I'm assuming, that they measure nitrate. But if they're measuring nitrate, nitrogen, they're dead, okay? So it's really important 
to know when you test it what it was tested for. Okay? What it was tested for. 